Hello, how are you doing? My name is Tracy McGregor. I'm an instructor with EMS University. I've been involved with EMS and uh, CPR instruction for a little over five years. I've maintained a nationally uh, registered EMT since 2005. In addition, I've been involved with the fire and EMS system for a little over 14 years. <coughs> Some of the things we're going to talk about today is poisoning and overdose. Um, with the poisoning and overdose slideshow, I do apologize. It's not the slideshow I wanted to present. Um, I can't get my slides to save on the program as easy as I thought I would. So please bear with me. There's going to be a lot more voice lecture than visual. Uh, but let's go ahead and get started. Poison control phone number. Um, every fire apparatus, every EMS apparatus should have the phone number for the Poison Control Center somewhere on the truck. Um, and most of us, you know, should really know how to find it. But this is a good, um, useful tool to have just for around the house. So here's the Poison Control phone number, which is 1 800 222 1222. Poisoning. You have poisonings and overdoses. Poisonings can be both accidental and intentional. Uh, what the <clears throat> definition is an adverse effect of plant, foods, chemicals, or pharmaceutical agents on the body. Overdoses, they say, is an intentional, but it's also unintentional. They may be uh, excessive doses of medication or any other substance out there in the world. Um, but medication can be one of the more common ones. However, I think also alcohol uh, is about one of the highest ones because it accounts for about 2,000 or 200,000 deaths per year in the United States. So we'll press on with this. So two peak age groups, you have toddlers to preschool age uh, when children are exploring their environment. Also keep in mind household chemicals are one of the forerunners on um, children getting uh, poisoned. Also, something I'd like to really uh, discuss are the newer laundry detergent packets that have come out into the market over the last you know, couple of years. To children, they, um, they look appetizing. They look like candy. They look like a treat. However, they have very, very harmful effects on the gastrointestinal system. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, try to find out that information from mom or dad or whoever's present uh, and, and really try to explore if that's something they may have ingested. Also see, keep in mind, odor is a big, um, a big way to deduce whether or not they have uh, ingested, particularly a household type chemical. Um, with young adults, I don't think that's a big shock to anybody. Um, it says it's in a form of suicidal behavior, but that's not the case. Um, young adults find themselves experimenting with alcohol, uh, recreational drugs, and so sometimes they just don't know their limitations, particularly with alcohol, and uh, you know they get themselves into trouble. Obviously, it can be a suicidal form of behavior, but that's not always the case in, in this particular situation. Okay, before I, I press into alcohol, I want to talk about the routes of exposure, um, introductions into the body. You have inhalation, absorption, ingestion, and injection. <clears throat> For inhaled poisons, some of the things you may want to consider are um, natural gas, <clears throat> pesticides, carbon monoxide, um, if that's the case, the fire department does need to be present and they have their gas detectors and, um, you know, they'll check it out. Chlorine, you know, if a patient is involved with chlorine, chlorine is a very nasty and dangerous inhalant. Uh, basically, it chlorine is known as a choking agent. <clears throat> um, it can be involved with... Um, C. Bernie type incidents as well, uh, so just keep that in mind. With about a thousand parts per million, um, a person who inhales chlorine can 
uh, expire from that. Because like I said, it is a choking agent. <clears throat> so next I'd like to talk about some um, absorption. Chemicals can be absorbed in the body via the skin, mucous membranes, eyes, and uh, you're typically going to find this in like petroleum products, acids, alkalis, even something so simple as poison oak and poison ivy. However, if a patient has um, a severe allergic reaction, then you're also going to be dealing with anaphylaxis. So, in those types of situations, try to get MSDSs, um, especially for chemicals, and try to find out what's going to help that. If it's, you know, powder, is it something so simple as just brushing it away and wiping it off? Or is it going to be something like, you know, brushing it away and, you know, cool, you know, getting water on that? Because some chemicals can be water reactive and then you're going to cause even more irritation to the skin. So, and stuff like absorption where chemicals involved, keep in mind to check MSDSs if they have them. Um, if it's something like a household cleaner that's very volatile and absorbs into the body, either one, check with poison control, or number two, they're going to have information um, on the either label or you can call. Ingested poisons um, account for approximately 80% of all poisonings by mouth. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Uh, it could be anything from household cleaners, contaminated foods, plants, um, drugs, and ingestion of poisons. Like I talked about, you know, with kids, they want to, you know, try stuff because, of, you know, Windex looks like Kool-Aid to them, or, you know, the new laundry uh, packets look tasty to them. So keep that in mind, and that's also something where you're going to have to start looking into activated charcoal, which we will discuss later on in this slideshow. Injective poisons. Um, you typically think of illicit drugs, heroin, cocaine. Um, <clears throat> however, there's a lot more to that. You know, that can be anything from a snake bite. It could be anything from, you know, your typical illicit drugs. It could be anything from uh, a sharp, you know, stick. So that's just something to keep in mind. In this particular slideshow, I'm going to discuss alcohol, but I'm going to go off of uh, an external source, and I'm going to avoid the hypothermia, because this talks about hypothermia and alcohol, but alcohol can also be combined with hyperthermia, um, dehydration, which can also be caused by the alcohol, but you have a myriad of uh, various reasons why alcohol doesn't mix with certain things. So pressing on with that, like I said previously in the slideshow, accounts for about 200,000 uh, 200, deaths involving alcohol. Um, roughly 60 to 70 percent of murders are, have alcohol as a factor involved. Um, <clears throat> about 40 percent of traffic fatalities, they say, have alcohol involved. However, at this point, I'm pretty sure it's probably increased since uh, this uh, book was created, and about 30% of suicides have alcohol involvement. We all know that alcohol is depressant. It has significant effects on the um, your internal organs as well as your central nervous system. So if it's something like a possible alcohol overdose, just try and keep in mind. Um, Obviously, you're going to check the presence um, when you're doing your patient assessments and your general impression. You kind of know the difference between whether a person is drunk or any other type of situation. However, as we've all known from uh, uh, diabetes, don't ever just immediately assume. But typically, if somebody finds somebody in such a state where they feel like they need to call 911, you're going to have a bystander who's actually going to probably be able to provide a lot of information. Um, but just remember, you know, that patient may be kind of or catatonic. Um, emesis may be an issue where they're vomiting. Um, and if they have internal bleeding, like, you know, an ulcer or some other issue, they may have um, 
hematemesis, excuse me, which is vomiting with blood. So, <clears throat> if a patient is going through withdrawal, um, you know this is also another situation you might you might find yourself in. Uh, keep in mind that they may be going through delirium tremens, uh, DTs, and you know within about one to seven days after the person stops drinking, um, alcohol withdrawal will set in. Keep in mind agitation, restlessness, fever, sweating. Um, confusion, ultra level of consciousness, and even as far as seizures can be an issue. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, one of the most important things I see on the slide is that alcohol is a vasodilator. So here's a uh, flow chart of how alcohol you know, works on the body, which is actually kind of really good information. Um, so, in times where you want to kick back and have a couple of drinks, um, menthol, toxic wood alcohol, also found in varying amounts, such as um, wine, I think is what they're talking about, but red wine, brandy, and whiskey contain most menthol, spirits like vodka contain the least. Uh, just one of those OG Wiz facts. Alcohol quickly absorbs into the stomach, um, especially if it's taken on an empty stomach. When it goes into the small intestine, the pyloric valve opens. The drink pours into a small intestine. Greater surface area allows for alcohol to be absorbed far more rapidly. Um, the ethanol, which is a diuretic, acts on the brain's pituitary gland, blocking the production of, a, of the hormone, which directs kidneys to reabsorb water once this hormone is switched off. Um, you increase urination which anybody who's had more than a few drinks can see how that works out. And it talks about the liver, how it breaks down alcohols, and it forms from acetaldehyde, pardon me if I said it wrong, and formaldehyde into acidic acid and formic acid. Uh, so basically with that um, toxic formic acid, it's what causes the heavier hangover effects. <clears throat> the brain shrinks due to loss of water, stretching pain sensitive filaments, which cause connective or which the, connect to the skull, causing a headache. And in dehydration, loss of essential ions, sodium, potassium, magnesium, and calcium, which cause nervous or nerves and muscles, uh, causes nausea, headache, fatigue, and that foggy in the morning uh, feeling. We've already discussed the routes of absorption. <clears throat> Scene safe or survey. Basically, the biggest thing you can discern from this slide is your scene safety. Okay, if there are specific chemicals, do not transport materials that may be risky, such as like you know, don't don't take a vial of a chemical that's been involved with the hazmat. Is what it's saying. Um, vomit or stool samples. I'm sure the ER room will get plenty of that. <clears throat> Some of the specific questions, um, poisoning and overdose questions, are substances. When was the pa when was the patient exposed? When was it ingested? Amount, time, period, interventions, estimated weight, and a sample history. If you have a bystander, family member, or friend, try to get an OPT or ST. That's also very useful information. Also take a look as you are assessing the patient, try to keep an eye on your surroundings. Are there a ton of beer cans? Are there a ton of um, pill bottles? Are there hypodermic needles? Are there pipes for, you know, um, crack? So just keep an eye on that type of stuff. So in this, uh, this slide, it talks about some of the additional information and special considerations for your, your routes of ingestion um, or introduction, I should say. Uh, but some of the things I want to discuss especially are some of the poisons, the most common ones that are available or that may be encountered on an emergency. 
uh, sedative hypnotic drugs or hypnotic drugs such as barbiturates and benzodiazepines. Um, for barbiturates, you may have Adamol, uh, Budasol, Nematol, Luminol, or Secanol. <clears throat> for uh, benzodiazepines, Xanax, Librium, Valium, uh, Rufinol, others like uh, Flexerol, uh, rubbing alcohol. These are um, these can be uh, easily obtained via prescription from a doctor. Some of them can be over the counter. Basically, what these things do is, uh, if you find a patient who takes these, you know, they may be sedated, uh, peaceful. Some people like to take them with uh, alcohol, which can cause a major issue. <clears throat> with sedative hypnotic drugs, uh, <clears throat> like roofies, uh, which are known as date rape drugs, uh, they can basically cause a person to go into a, uh, a sedated or unconscious state. Uh, treatment for patients on sedative or hypnotic drugs and have uh, respiratory depression, you're going to obviously care for the, the uh, airway, oxygen treatment, and um, in certain situations, if you have a paramedic on board, they may be able to uh, use uh, flumezinol. Uh, in that case, that's obviously way out of our scope of practice, but it's just something, you know, just kind of one of those OG whiz things. Uh, basically, with all the other issues, um, the best thing we can do as BLS providers is try to get the information on what's been given to them, what they've taken. Uh, be it intentional or in intentional, um, and treat for uh, everything we can on a BLS provisional level. Some of the BS um, inhalants I'd like to talk about um, are basically things that people will smell or sniff to get high. Uh, some of those things are like acetone, xylene, tulene, hexane, um, which are basically found in glues. Uh, basically, these people, it kills the brain cells and leaves them in all kinds of strange states. In some situations, um, you know, these people may have an ultra level of conscious. They may become combative. They may go into seizures, hypertension. Um, <clears throat> one of the things I saw was... Um, with halogenated hypocarbon solvents, uh, basically this can play tricks with the patient's adrenaline and um, certain things like even walking or struggling with the uh, medical providers can cause the person to um, exert themselves. So basically one of the best things you could do is try to work with the patient. Um, if you must, restrain the patient, get law enforcement obviously with you to help you and um, primarily give them supplemental oxygen and rapid transport, consider ALS intervention, um, intercept, and any other thing that you need to do, uh, depending on the uh, specific emergency. <clears throat> Some um, sympathomimetics, uh, which are basically stimulants that cause a fight or, fight or flight effect on the nervous systems. Some of the typical sympathomimetics, and forgive me if I'm saying it wrong, um, are typical things like ecstasy, fenfen, um, meth, uh, which have all kinds of fun street names like Adam, Benny's, Crank, DOM, Ecstasy, Eve, which are both MDMAs, uh, and the fenfen, you have uh, Fenterman uh, with ice. Uh, basically that's cocaine, uh, crack cocaine, methamphetamine, speed, PCPs, and uppers. With these types of situations, um, because you have so many different things like PCP, MDMA, methamphetamine, um, be very cautious of your own safety and health 
ensure that law enforcement is present while you're assessing and dealing with these patients. Uh, these patients typically are for high risk of cardiac arrhythmias, um, seizures, strokes. So keep an eye on their blood pressure while you're taking, um, taking blood pressures and assessing the patient. On a BLS level, all you can do is provide supplemental oxygen and, um, you know, if you have to, suction for the patient. Hallucinogens, um, your typical stuff, DMT, hashish, uh, marijuana, mescaline, mushrooms, PCP, which I'm not really sure why PCP. I guess this is straight PCP, whereas uh, sympathomatics uh, um, has a street name of STP. <clears throat> With hallucinogens, um, you're going to see patients who've taken it either by oral, nasal, or IV routes. With these types of situations, you would probably be better off getting um, ALS intercept on these types of situations. But basically, from a BLS provider's standpoint, supplemental oxygen, try to reassure, comfort the patient, especially if they're having hallucinations um, and any uh, type of secondary issues like injuries, which have been caused as a result of these. Some of the other uh, miscellaneous drugs that I'd really like to uh, talk about are the synthetic drugs that have recently kind of been a trend over the last couple of years, such as bath salts and spice. Um, these drugs are very harmful and can cause some extremely violent reactions on patients. And um, in some certain situations, like with bath salts, it can give uh, people almost like a superhuman strength. So keep in mind of that, try to check up on that, do a little research for yourself on those types of uh, drugs because they, uh, they're pretty nasty. So just keep an eye out for that. Um, also, some of the other things I'd like to talk about are plant poisonings. Um, each region and state has its own variable plants, um, which can you know be really dangerous to patients, such as uh, Jimson weed. Um, poison ivy, like I said, especially in certain situations like uh, anaphylaxis and what have you. <clears throat> but like I said, each individual uh, region of the country has its own, you know, own plants that can cause issues where others may or may not have, you know, higher or lower amounts. Uh, food poisoning is always a big one. Uh, that is a poisoning, so, uh, you know, you have... You have a variable um, myriad of types of food poisonings like Bacillus um Salmonella. Um, so just keep an eye on that. Try to find out, um, you know, if they've had anything that they may suspect which have, may have caused, caused food poisoning. Some fatally ingested poisons such as hydrocarbon si uh, solvents, um, benzocaine, can't for. Um, basically, the unfortunate part is with all these types of stuff, you need to do, you need to do detective work. You need to do a lot of uh, deducing of uh, what's coming out of that patient's mouth to try and discern whether or not this is something that can be life-threatening or if it's something that, you know, is kind of routine but maybe an overreaction. But if you suspect a poisoning or an overdose, you certainly want to keep an MSDS with you, especially with poison control. Provide a very good patient assessment. Ensure law enforcement's there because if it's a poisoning or an overdose, they're most likely going to have to investigate it. Um, as with most emergency situations, you should also always have law enforcement with you. Like I said, uh, make sure you do your general impression, impressions. You've seen assessments before all, excuse me. Um, try and find out um, whether or not they have an ALSC. <clears throat> Get a good sample history and OPQ or ST. Uh, as I said before, um, you know, these slides aren't, aren't really the greatest, so I went off and kind of went on my own stuff. But I just wanted to bring the attention of some of the things that aren't discussed in the slideshow. 
Um, one last note is activated charcoal. I know activated charcoal in some certain areas has kind of been taken off the trucks. Certain situations in certain areas, you know, they leave them on or, you know, that's really up to your medical direction and your state protocol. Should you have activated charcoal, activated charcoal, like I said, it binds with the poison um, and basically carries itself out. Some of the things you should not use activated charcoal on are bleach, ammonia, or ethanol ethyl alcohol oh, excuse me and try to get it in within one hour and that's really the one slide I wanted to point out here on the slideshow but I hope this information was useful to you all and I hope uh, everything else is kind of useful in this uh, program so good luck and thank you for your time